Hello, everybody. I'm Kevin. I'm a part of the page group, and I'm here to give my talk today about shifting the spectrum on digital light processing 3D printing. Let's start. So the way that digital light processing works is that pattern light is shined from an LED projector, and then it is projected into like this mirror device that is then signed up into this liquid resin vat. That pattern light will then generate solid pattern polymer layers that are then stacked onto each other to create the final print. Compared to your traditional extrusion-based methods, digital light processing makes it easier to print out more complex objects owing to the finely patterned light and the fact that the starting material is a liquid resin instead of a solid filament. However, the issue is that a lot of DLP methods today utilize UV light to do their printing. While UV light is pretty rapid to cure, it's also rather energetic, and that can degrade the quality of your prints along with the fact that it also prevents the use of biological applications. Visible light, however, does get you a lot of these advantages, such as biocompatibility, and also this functional root tolerance, and also larger penetration depth and reduced scattering, but it's also rather slow to cure, and the resolution of the prints generated is also rather low. Therefore, our research mainly focused on identifying new photoredox catalysts that would enable fast and high resolution 3D printing in the visible spectrum, as seen here with these four candidates. You can see on the far left, this vapor right here, photopolymerizes really fast under 405 nanometer violet light, while on the other side of the spectrum, this zinc TPP right there will initiate really fast photopolymerization under 617 nanometer red light. So we have some pretty nice variation across the visible spectrum, as we can see above. However, and also, these photoredox catalysts are very good and can be used in a variety of different resins. For one, if you wanted to say kind of a really hard and stiff object, you can stick your photoredox catalyst system into this system on the far left made out of DMA and TMPTA and get a hard, stiff print. If you wanted something that was softer and stretchier, you could then stick your photoredox catalyst into a softer resin made up of these monitors to the right, this Kia and this Tegda, and that gets you all something that allows you to print out something that's a lot softer and stretchier. However, it's not quite as simple as just simply putting your as simply putting in your product redox catalyst into your mono resins and letting them go. Here is an example of a resolution print that we actually use to create our, to do analyze quantify our resolutions. We can see it's pretty rectangular on the outside, and inside the middle we have 12 squares with a number on there. That number corresponds to the amount of seconds that that red layer is exposed to visible light. However, though, when we actually print this out, though, with our resin, we see that it's actually rather undefined and blobby on the edge. You can see it's pretty rectangular. Resolution is really, really, really low. And also, if we see circled in blue, we have some notching in the middle of the print that is known as cure through. The reason why this phenomenon is observed is simply because of light diffraction. So essentially, that pattern polymer light, pattern light will hit that target area and create that desired polymer layer. But then some of those photons will scatter and diffract through the resin and trigger undesired polymerization elsewhere in the system. And that is the reason why we get this, why we get this like lower resolution and this blobbiness that you saw in the previous photo. The solution that we found was to use a type of compound known as an opaquing agent. These opaquing agents absorb certain wavelengths of light and prevent it from diffracting, from like diffracting through, as you can see in the figure to the right. And that essentially keeps that pattern light into that region and allows for more sharper resolutions. We can see right here that once you dope that resin with the opaquing agent and print it out, you can see that it's a lot more defined, a lot more rectangular, a lot more rectangular and a lot more detailed, looks a lot closer to the actual print file. So we have some really nice resolution increases there. The downside, though, is that you can see that that one second skirt on the far left no longer actually appears. And that's just simply because of the fact that like the opaque agents do absorb some light, and that slows us down your polymerization. Therefore, one of my jobs in this project was to basically find that sweet spot, that balanced out accuracy of resolution with high polymerization speed. Too much opaque agent, and you get nothing at all. But if you don't have enough opaque agent, then basically you, their print looks really inaccurate, and then there's really no point to doing it. Additionally, there is another problem too that just simply comes from the oxygen we breathe in the air around us. What happens is that oxygen can come in, it can basically interfere and bind with these catalysts, as you can see right here. And the end result of that is that that essentially interferes with your polymerization reactions and the prints don't go, don't go to completion. As you can see right here, where we're getting the one and two seconds don't show up. And even at like five seconds, we're struggling to get a lot of detail on this resolution print. Thus, the solution that we found was to use inert gas flow. So essentially, our printing chamber here is hooked up to a tank of some sort of inert gas, namely nitrogen or argon. And then as you're printing through, you basically flush the atmosphere with the flow of inert gas. What that does is that the inert gas will displace the oxygen from the atmosphere and in the resin and prevent it from interfering with their catalytic cycle. And that allows your polymerizations to go to completion and for prints to look a lot more high in resolution. We can see right here, we take that same resin with the zinc TPP inside. And when we actually turn it out without the oxygen, with the oxygen removed from the gassing, we can see a lot more detail. Even at like two seconds, we're getting a lot of the pixel, tiny pixels showing up, which is a marked increase in resolution, which is what we exactly wanted to see. We can also make some additional, more complex prints with this, such as a digital truss right here, or we can see that our digital rendering to the left 
and also the printed results to the right look a lot pretty close to each other. That's very good. We want this high resolution resolution, and that's going to be good for future prints. However, it's not going to be that simple because of the fact that, again, this requires inert gas. And I'm presuming that most of you don't have, say, a tank of argon lying around somewhere in your garage. So to make this more accessible to the average consumer, we dope our resins with a type of a compound known as a thiol. This thiol, as you can see to the left right here, this PETMP, that scavenges oxygen from the atmosphere and inside the resin. And by doing so, that'll prevent it from interfering with the catalytic cycle and allow your photopolymerization to go to completion and a lot faster. As you can see in the figure to the right, where we can see that once you have the file is included inside your resin, the rates go up a lot faster and sooner, which is exactly what we want to see. And this is also reflected in the print scope with these file doped resins. As you can see right here, here's an example of that same resolution print with the file inside. I'll get some pretty good detail, even at say six seconds or so. And if we take a closer look at 12 seconds, we can see a little, little nice little squared rectangular pixel arrays in the middle. And we can zoom in a little further to see basically these resolutions down at the microstructure scale. We can also, again, use these resins to print out more complex objects, like this 120 phase cell space cell here. And we can see that the digital rendering and the actual print look very close, lots and lots of nice detail. We can then zoom in a little bit further. So let's say instead of here, we go through the millimeter and then to the micrometer scale. And we can see those little like stacked layers right there are very, very sharply defined. They look very, very clear. You can see them very clearly. And that is exactly what we want to see when it comes to printing out, printing out objects with these resins. So essentially, we have shown that we have demonstrated fast and high resolution 3D printing with visible light. So where do we go from here? Where can we take our research further? The first, again, as noted before, is the bio compatibility. As noted before, visible light is less energetic and thus allows for biological applications such as printing out organisms, such as, for example, coral scaffolding with the coral polyps themselves for use in like revitalizing depleted coral reef ecosystems. Another opportunity, of course, is that you can print out tissue mimetics with these for like human tissue. And that enables more accurate modeling for like this, for like making new drugs and treatments for different diseases. Other application for this course, this is going to be a little more theoretical, is just something to quantify and improve our resin efficiency with the different catalysts that we use, possibly synthesizing some new ones. All that enables us to do essentially is to see like which wavelength of light and the corresponding intensity of that light allows for the most efficient 3D printing that's the most environmentally friendly. And that's basically the my current project that I'm working on to optimize our 3D printing and take it to the next level. With that in mind, I'd like to give some acknowledgement. First of all, to my professor PI, Professor Zach Page, in the audience right here. Thank you so much. And my mentor for these product research, postdoctoral scholar Dewan, who is now a scientist in South Korea. We wish him the best of luck in his endeavors. And another crucial collaborator, our 30 year graduate student, Lin, right here. Thank you all so much. Without alone, there would be no research, there would be no 3D printing advances that you see here. I cannot thank them enough. And finally, I would like to thank all of you for coming to my talk, and I'll happily take any questions.